So I'm going to talk about a paradox, uh, a theme that rises from my writing, and I've been doing this at the Wall Street Journal for about 20 years, but lately there's this common theme in a lot of my writing, and it's that the experts keep getting it wrong, and outsiders, unexpected outsiders, uh, are the ones who are calling the future and getting it right and making a lot of money and leading the way. And I'm going to talk about it, maybe give a couple of ideas why that's the case, why, why the experts keep getting it wrong. But first, let me make my point. Why is it that, why do I say that the experts keep getting it wrong? So if you think about the biggest themes, the biggest business themes in the last decade or so, let's go back to the financial crisis, for example. Who should have anticipated the financial crisis, the mortgage meltdown? It should have been the Fed, uh, it should have been Bernanke, Geithner, et cetera, Greenspan, obviously. It should have been the banks, and it should have been short sellers like Jim Chanos and, and mortgage investors, Michael Vranos, people like that. They all got it wrong. All the experts got it wrong. And if you think about it, as a bank, um, they're the ones who suffered the most. The banks suffered the most, and they're the ones who created the mortgage product, the toxic mortgage product. It's a little bit like a uh, butcher who's got this poisonous meat, and instead of kind of serving it to customers uh, and, and being, getting rid of it, he brings it home and feeds it to his kids himself, and they all get sick. And that's sort of what happens, because they didn't know how bad it was, how toxic it was, the mortgage product they were creating. So... The experts got it completely wrong. And who got it right? Who anticipated the financial meltdown? Again, it wasn't the people you would have expected. Jim Chanos goes to sleep at night praying for a financial meltdown. He did all right. He didn't he went and make so much. He wasn't the one that kind of came out on top. Um, again, Michael Varinas is a mortgage investor. Bill Gross is a bond investor. They did fine. They did okay. They survived. They're not the ones who made the greatest trade ever. So that's a book I wrote about a guy named John Paulson. And he, again, is one of these unexpected uh, success stories. He had kicked around for a number of years on Wall Street, sort of a singles hitter, nothing special, not a home run hitter. He was a mortgage investor, uh, like you and I were mortgage investors, meaning he wasn't. He knew nothing about mortgages or CDOs or CDS contracts. He bought and sold a couple of houses over the years, but you, know, you and I did that as well. So um, he was a merger arbitrageur. He didn't really kind of focus on the housing market, and yet he got a little nervous about housing. He had a guy working for him named Paolo Pellegrini who knew a little bit, not much either, about credit fault swaps and how to use them. They together spent the time, figured it out, how to express that, their bearishness, and they put on a trade that made $20 billion over two years. And there are other people that I write about in my book that were similarly um, surprising success stories. There's a... Um, a guy named Jeffrey Green. Jeffrey Green was a real estate investor out in Los Angeles, but just an individual. And um, until then, he was just sort of a playboy who had spent his life um, enjoying himself in Los Angeles. He, had a, uh, he got married late in life, and the uh, best man in his wedding was Mike Tyson, the uh, boxer. So, and he made $500 million from a mortgage meltdown that Geithner and Greenspan and Bernanke were shocked by. So again, the outsiders. And... A few years later, I got excited about the energy revolution in this country. Um, all of a sudden, we've got so much oil and gas that we're exporting it. We were running out a few years ago, and now we're exporting it. The oil and gas industry, the Exxon Mobiles of the world, the powers, they had given up on America. They figured we were running out of oil and gas. That's what all the experts said. The conventional wisdom was we were running out of natural gas, so we were going to have to import it. So we developed these big facilities uh, in places like Louisiana to import liquefied natural gas because we were running out. And, country, and companies like ExxonMobil, they gave up on America. They were drilling anywhere but America. They were going offshore, Africa, Asia, not in Texas. Literally, Exxon's headquarters are in Irving, Texas. And underneath uh, its headquarters is the Barnett Basin, which is the epicenter of the, the ground zero for the shale revolution. And Exxon wasn't even drilling literally underneath its own um, headquarters. They had given up on America. So again, all the experts got it wrong. They thought we were running out of oil and gas. And it took some real outsiders to say, you know what, let's see if we can figure out how to get shale to give up oil and gas in this country. And that's what the fracking revolution is about. And I wrote a book called The Frackers, and I had the pleasure of traveling the country, meeting some of these people, and they're very unconventional, and they're very unusual. Um, there's an individual named George Mitchell, 
who's the father of the fracking revolution. And he had a natural gas company for many years uh, in Texas. And they were okay. They were in a power. They were kind of mid-sized. And they were running out of natural gas. And he didn't have acreage offshore in Africa and Asia like the Chevrons and the BPs and Exxons did. So he was forced to search in Texas. That's all he had was Texas. And he told his guys, he was upbeat, he was optimistic, he was creative, and he said to his guys, we can figure it out. But for years, they tried and failed, tried and failed, and they finally figured it out in about 1998, how to get natural gas from Texas in this area, the Barnett Shale. And that was the first step in the revolution. There were other people, other revolutionaries, uh, including a guy named uh, Harold Hamm, um, who I spent a lot of time with, who uh, runs a company called Continental Resources. And again, he was very much like a John Paulson. People in the industry kind of knew of him, but he wasn't anything special. He believed in North Dakota and the promise of the Bakken region up there. But other people had heard about it and gave up on it. And he kind of said, guys, we've got to figure it out. We can do it. And they combined fracking, which people probably have some understanding of in this room, and, and horizontal drilling. That's really the key to the revolution, where they drill down and they turn the drill a bit 90 degrees and they move horizontally. And they found so much oil that now the Bakken region produces about a million and a half barrels a day. And now we're exporting oil. Who would have thought? I mean, people in this room, I'm sure, remember the time when we were scared about our future as a country because we were dependent on nations that we, frankly, don't have that much in common with and we don't like so much. And now we've got so much oil and gas that we're exporting and prices have come down both uh, in the United States uh, and internationally now. So it's a real revolution that, again, the outsiders got and the insiders, the experts, were completely baffled by and shocked by. And eventually they caught up and Exxon bought some shale producers and Chevron and those kinds of companies, but they were caught flat-footed. So it, 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 it continues to repeat itself. I mean, most recently, if you look at the election, um, who predicted um, President Trump? You look at Brexit, the experts all got it wrong. And you look at sort of performance today, my 60-40 Vanguard mutual fund is destroying all the hedge funds. Who, who can compete with my Vanguard fund? Nobody can. And they, even if you set aside the, the charges, but obviously the fees are quite high and people are catching up. And it's funny, the average individual investor He's ahead of the professional over the last few years. They've realized that it's hard to beat the market. It's really an efficient market. So I'm just going to be in ETFs or index funds. And have, you can have a balanced portfolio with, with both. And they're destroying their pros who are clinging to expensive uh, hedge funds and private equity firms and VC firms. That's not to say that there aren't brilliant investors in those worlds. And there is strong performance here and there. But on average, the hedge fund industry has underperformed for years and years. And again, the, the endowments and the family offices are still kind of think who, who are supposed to be the smart money. They're still throwing money at hedge funds when the performance is in poor. Now, there are all kinds of reasons you, you could explain. And frankly, this probably is the best time to be in hedge funds because everything's expensive. So the weird thing is that endowments... Um, they all shifted away from hedge funds uh, a few years ago, right when they should have, uh, I'm sorry, they, yeah, they, they, that, they shifted to hedge funds after the 2008 crisis when things were cheap. You don't get out of, of, a, of, you don't get out of the market when things are cheap. And now uh, is really a better time as being alternative investments because things are quite expensive. So again, the individuals, the, the outside types, uh, the non-experts keep getting it right and the experts keep getting it wrong. And again, the election and, and calling the election and all those kind of things um, proves it over time again. So that's a theme that I find quite fascinating. And if you look at today, I'm writing a book now about the biggest quant uh, firm out there. And it's a group of mathematicians. So all the books they've been reading about investing all these years, and we all read the Buffett books and um, Graham and Dodd, etc. These guys couldn't care less about that stuff. They don't even care about companies, the underlying um, companies that they invest in. They're mathematicians, and they're the ones who figured out investing. The non-investors have figured out an investing game that we've all been trying to understand and, and master uh, for decades and decades. So I find that fascinating, that theme. And I'll just throw out, because it's not that much time, I'll throw out a few um, possible uh, explanations, perhaps, for why it is, again, that the uh, experts keep getting it wrong. And I keep writing these books about these, these themes, which I, maybe it's just me, but I find it kind of fascinating. So one uh, theme that I keep coming back to is the fact that um, 
if you need to uh, make something happen, you often do. And uh, if your back is against the wall, it actually helps. So there are individuals in my book, The Frackers, who were running out of cash, and they were oil and gas companies in this country, and they were in entrepreneurs, they were wildcatters, and all they had, as I kind of suggested earlier with, with George Mitchell, all they had was American acreage. So the other big companies that had flexibility to go any other places, offshore and that kind of thing, they did so, and they gave up on America. But the guys who had their backs against the wall um, had to, were forced to figure out a method to tap this oil and gas in this country. And you see it time and time again. So it almost helps having that back against the wall um, and... And sometimes um, when you're in a better position, you don't uh, innovate. If you think about the best innovation over the past you know, decade or two um, in many kinds of industries, you look at the pharmaceutical industry, you know, big pharma isn't really buying, I'm sorry, isn't really developing so many breakthrough um, um, developments anymore. It's sort of they're buying them. They're buying companies. So um, there's a company called Kite Phar um, 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 th Therapeutics, which does immunotherapy for cancer. And they were just bought recently by Big Pharma. And that's happening time and time again. And to me, the immunotherapy revolution is among the most exciting things going out there in the business world. And again, it's being led by smaller companies, more nimble, um, people that can adjust a little bit on the fly, and people that don't have other options. They're not these big uh, pharmaceutical companies. You see it all uh, in other kind of industries too. You see um, energy drinks, you know, weren't developed by the big, the big companies, um, the, the Cokes and the, and the Pepsis. They had to buy those kind of things. Uh, you see the e-cigarettes as well. It wasn't big tobacco. Um, they, they, again, they, they bought in. So often it, the, you need that um, ability. Uh, it almost hurts you having the flexibility and the cash and the, and the cushion. You know, Microsoft could have been the ones to develop a search. They're, they had a group that was doing search, and they kind of said, nah, let's forget about it, and that allowed Google uh, to step up. Um, it's also the case that the people that um, were big talkers on Wall Street about being contrarians, but very few people are contrarians. There really is no incentive to be a contrarian. In my first book, The Greatest Trade Ever, there's a guy named Greg Lippman who was working at Deutsche Bank and he was worried about the housing market and wanted to put on trades, uh, short trades. And everyone kind of told him not to within the bank and he eventually did, but it didn't really help the bank that much because so many people were losing money. And within an organization, you get paid well to keep your job. And if you're taking an unconventional stance, a contrarian stance, um, that can hurt your career. That could really could cripple your career. You could lose your career. And the guys that, who rises to the tops within organizations, it's not the people that kind of close their door and, and imagine, close their eyes and imagine what could go wrong in the world. That's often kind of outsider, hedge funding type of people that kind of anticipated the financial meltdown. The people that, that, that rise to the, to the top are kind of positive people, people who say how we can beat the last quarter's earnings, that kind of thing. And so organizations have a tough time with these kind of contrarian type people. Um, the last point I'm just going to make is that when it comes to politics, the way I kind of understand it, and, and it worries me how, how the um, experts keep getting it wrong and outsiders get it right, is that we've got this polarization and echo chamber effect in that we, and I kind of uh, include myself in this, we speak to similar types of people, similar like-minded people, would read things that we want to read. You'd be surprised. I travel the country and I give speeches and um, people either kind of are on the right and they're watching Fox and they're listening to some of those uh, talk show stations, radio stations, etc. And they go on Facebook and, and they read the things that they want to read. That sort of echoes some of their thoughts. Or they're more on the left, more progressive and it's MSNBC and um, the reading um, New York Times and other kinds of things. And there isn't that much of an exchange of ideas like there used to be. There's very um, um, little... Um, in the past, people would kind of read a more of a mainstream paper and you'd have more um, similar themes. You'd get a more of an exposure. And people now don't, don't feel the need to. Um, they subscribe to things that they want to read. And it's often uh, um, reflects things that they are read, the conclusions they've already come to. And it's troublesome. It's bad for all of us. And it sort of accentuates and creates more of a polarization uh, in our nation, which to me is really troubling. So again, when I wrote this fracking book, it was either uh, fracking poisons um, or drill, baby, drill. When you 
go around and talk to people. And I'm more of a moderate, and I see some positives. I see a lot of positives in oil and gas drilling and, and fracking and hydraulic fracturing. But there's also some risks, a lot of risks and dangers, and you have to address those. And people didn't want to hear kind of any kind of nuanced argument as you talk to them. And it's true of almost any um, theme of importance uh, in this nation. There's very little moderation. There's very little um, interest in hearing the other side. So to me, that's troublesome, but... Um, to uh, end it on a, uh, a, ne a negative theme, so I'll just kind of leave more positively. There are some really great things going on. I hinted earlier about this immunotherapy a revolution going on, cancer immunotherapy. There's all kinds of interesting biotech developments going on, people making real advances um, that excite me as a reporter, as a writer, and uh, continuing to write about them. Stay in touch. Gregory.Zuckerman at WJ.com or follow me on Twitter, and I'd love to hear your own thoughts. Thank you.